Today is January 29th, 2022. This is Mordecai, host of the updates, bringing you your daily Eldening update. There is way too much news about Elden Ring today. I never thought I'd say that, but here we are. There is just so much stuff to go over that I would not be surprised if this ends up being the longest daily Elden Ring update so far. The Game Informer coverage has dropped a lot of info so far, so what I'm going over in this video will contain some spoilers, like NPC and area names, details about the world, gameplay footage, and so on. I will say though that this is mostly contained to Limgrave and a bit of the next biome, but this is all stuff from soft approve and wanted Game Informer and for people to see, so it's not exactly endgame content, but I just wanted to give you a warning in advance, just in case you want to go in blind. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's see what we have to go over. Firstly, the coverage we got so far includes two 5-minute gameplay videos of new areas, an 18-page cover story that has quotes from Miyazaki, a couple of articles on their website, and a 3-hour long Q&A Twitch stream from Daniel Tack, who is the person who wrote all these articles after he got to play the game for 10 hours and interview Miyazaki. He got to play the game remotely on his PC, so he didn't download the complete game or anything, and there was also a Bandai representative watching him play and stopping him from going to some areas that they did not want people to see. So once again, all the stuff I'm talking about is merely scratching the surface of Elden Ring. And for a bit of background, Dan is a big Souls fan, he's played all their games and is a resident expert on From Software, so rest assured, this coverage was in good hands. So anyway, if I refer to Daniel or Dan in this video, you'll know who I'm talking about. Alright, now that we have some background, let's talk about Elden Ring. So, when he booted up the game, these were the starting classes he could choose from. There's Vagabond, Warrior, Hero, Bandit, Astrologer, Prophet, Samurai, Prisoner, and finally, Intelligencer. Each of these have their own weapon, armor, or spells they may start with. I'm not sure which one is the wretch slash deprived class that we learned about from yesterday's interview, but perhaps it wasn't included in this build. Dantak picked the hero class, which is the strength build that starts with an axe, and he compared it to the barbarian class in Dungeons and Dragons. Additionally, you can pick a starting gift with your class, most of which is similar to the Souls games before, except Elden Ring has this one unique starting gift, called the Stone's Ward Key. This key, according to its description, breaks through the imp seal, aka these yellow gargoyle things next to these blue fog walls. After you use the key, the blue fog wall dissipates, and you can explore whatever is behind it. Dan used it on this one, and went down here, and apparently after the poison swamp area, these long ramps are filled with giant automated chariots with razor wheels, along with aggressive ghostly humanoid enemies that are armed with bows and melee weapons. So you must maneuver from alcove to alcove to get to safe cover. Unfortunately, Dan did not have enough time to explore this, so he moved on. But first, let's backtrack a bit. Before he got to this area in the first place, there were two new things. One is that after you pick your starting class, an opening cinematic plays. However, this cinematic is not the story trailer we got at the Game Awards. Rather, it's an entirely new cinematic that goes on for a couple of minutes and shows you the major characters of the game. To be more specific, it describes the fall of Queen Merica, how Godwin died on the Night of the Black Knives, and talks about some characters like the loathsome Dung Eater, an all-knowing knight, and finally, the chieftain of the ballads. The second new thing is that you spawn into an entirely new starting area, called the Chapel of Anticipation. This is a very short area with one singular road leading out, and at the end, you encounter the tutorial boss called the Grafted Scion, which is the same many-armed enemy we fought in that room in the network test. This is a fight where all odds are stacked against you, and you will die in one or two hits. And after you die, you get transported to the Fringe Folk Hero's Grave, the area we started at in the network test. I guess the Chapel of Anticipation is similar to the starting area in Demon Souls, where you're not expected to beat the Vanguard and dying to him takes you to the Nexus. Though it's unclear if you can come back to this chapel later on, 
as it's not on the map, and we also don't know what happens if you manage to beat it yet. Anyway, when Dan finally set out in the world, this is when he noticed that there were already a lot of differences between the network test version and the final version of the game. Throughout his playing time, he noticed that the item drops have changed a lot since the network test. Like, the Stone Digger Troll drops something entirely different than the Katana, Bloodhound Knight Darewell spawns at an entirely different Everjail, Flask of Wonders Physique spawns at a different place, and so on. More importantly though, he said Limgrave is much bigger than what we've seen so far, as there's East Limgrave, West Limgrave, the Weeping Peninsula, and finally, Stormvale Castle. One of the bigger changes, he said, is that the game felt much harder, especially Spirit Summons, as they felt pretty useless and nerfed in the final game according to Dan. But more on that in a bit. Dan did comment that he did not notice any changes in the HUD or UI, but he said he wasn't really paying attention to that. Alright, so I thought about many different ways to approach this, but I think the best option is to talk about Elden Ring through its characters, just like the way Miyazaki and Martin intended. Starting with the Snow Witch, whose name we still don't know, but what we do know is that she actually appears at the Church of Ele, the same church at the beginning of the game where Kale and the workbench are at. She still has four arms and two faces in the game, and if you talk to her, she gives you the cube bell, which you use to summon spirits with. Moving on, there's Melina, who still functions the same way as the network test, in which she still asks you to accept her accord, and she gives you the spectral steed whistle for the mount. Immediately after you get it though, you can actually hop on your horse and take a side path up the mountain to the right of Castle Stormvale, skipping it in its entirety. Yes, you can skip not only Margit, but Godric and Stormvale completely, moving on to the next biome in the game. This new region, called Lurna of the Lake, houses the Raya Lucaria Magical Academy. More about this later, but anyway, if you rest at the first Sight of Lost Grace you see in this biome, you trigger another meeting with Melina, in which she whisks you away to the Round Table Hold, aka the hub area in Elden Ring. The Round Table Hold is not on the world map, as it's completely outside of the game's world and the lands between. In there, you will meet many NPCs that you've collected, one of whom is named Fia. This is the same girl from the screenshot we got in yesterday's tweet. I said in the last update that we're probably gonna find out her true identity from all the coverage we're getting, and well, what do you know? Anyway, Fia is also in the opening cinematic, and she's referred to as the Deathbed Champion. In the game, she asks to embrace you, and when you say yes, she gives you a consumable known as Baldekin's Blessing, which you can use to buff your poise. You can only carry one at a time, but you can come back at any point to get another if you run out. She kinda reminds me of Ariana from Bloodborne in that way, as she also gave you helpful item that you could only carry one of, although that item she gave you was a bit more personal. Anyway, the next character at the round table hold is an NPC named D. Yes, just the letter D. He's a masked, mysterious undead hunter who hunts down those who live in death. You actually recruit him from a graveyard in Eastern Limgrave. When you meet him, he warns you that this small town nearby named Summonwater has recently been plagued by this ghostly fiend. If you proceed to this village, you'll notice that it's a big shallow lake with a glowing boat in the middle. Once you get closer, boss music starts playing as you're about to fight the Bone Beckoner Mariner. This is a boss that summons skeletons to attack you, kind of similar to the ROM fight in Bloodborne. He also lifts up the boat and slams it into the ground, causing disaster if you're underneath or near it. The resulting waves do a lot of damage, but you can also use it to your advantage as it also damages the skeletons he spawns. Dan says that he had a much easier time beating him on the horse, and killing him gives you the Skeletal Militiaman Spirit Summon, which is apparently OP as they respawn once they die. The Bone Beckoner also gives you a death route after you've killed it, which its item description states that beast clergymen seek it out. You will then meet D in the hub area after this mission, and then he marks your map with a location of interest of notable beast clergymen. But Dantak did not have enough time to check out the spot D marked. And I believe this beast clergyman could be Garank. 
as the Beast Claw Incantation's item description refers to itself as a spell bestowed upon those who call the death route by Garank, the Beast Clergyman, who apparently was a beast of such terrifying ferocity that his former name meant Death of the Demigods, so I just cannot wait for this encounter. Another character that will be in the Roundtable hold is Roderica. Remember how I said Dan found the spirit summons to be useless as they weren't upgraded? Well, Roderica is apparently a spirit tuner, and her role here is to upgrade your spirit summons and make them stronger. She is initially found near the scavenger's shack on Storm Hill, and she tells you that she's afraid of what's been happening in the castle with people's limbs being taken and attached to the spider. She also gives you the jellyfish spirit summon, which is another item drop that's changed from the network test. Moving on, the blacksmith of Elden Ring is at the round table hold as well. His name is Blacksmith Hugh, and he helps you level up weapons from plus 3 onwards, as you can upgrade to plus 3 yourself at the makeshift workshop at the Church of LA. Blacksmith Hugh is also apparently a prisoner of the Round Table Hold, as he is chained up, but apparently he won't tell you why he's a prisoner. Anyway, the next character you meet here is named Corin a holy practitioner who can teach you faith-based skills. So if you're doing a faith build, they're the one you need to talk to. Then there's also Dialos, a man who's looking for a loyal servant to his house called Lanya. Additionally, the round table hold is way bigger than what you see in the screenshot, as it has a bunch of other rooms, some of which are locked, others that are open. In one of the rooms, you'll find an NPC that's leaning up against the wall who won't talk to you, but he gives you an emote for interacting with him. This is apparently a wall lean emote, one that is completely new as far as I'm aware. Moving on, there's another room that has the two maiden husks. These are some gruesome characters that want bell bearings from you for a certain purpose. Dan didn't have any, so he didn't find out what that was all about. There's also another character at the hub named the Loathsome Dung Eater, who Dan didn't really tell us anything about aside from the fact that he was also in the opening cinematic. Finally, off the main room, there's a balcony and an area underneath it. If you jump down to this area, you get invaded by an NPC invader named Frenzy Tongue. He apparently has extremely high mobility, boasts incredibly powerful magic, and uses a scythe that looks like Germans. There's apparently a lot of loot down there by where this invader is, but since Dan didn't have enough time to keep trying to kill this invader, he moved on. Aside from the hub, there are still some more characters in the overworld that they talked about, such as Jar Warrior Alexander. You meet him in the same spot as the gameplay demo, northeast of Limgrave. After hitting him with something big in the back and freeing him, he gives you some exalted flesh, which is an item that boosts your attack temporarily. Then, after some talking, he tells you to check out the Red Main Castle to the east, on the edge of the Scarlet Rot Blighted Kaelid Wilds. Now that is quite a bit of information. Firstly, the Kaelid Wilds on the east. This is the desert area on the far right of the map, and Dan talked a bit about this on the stream describing it as an area known as the Badlands, where you will explore a sandy desert with a scorching red sun. This is presumably where we'll find General Radon if he's still alive, as it looked like he was in some sort of desert battlefield, and the sky burning would match up with Dan's description. So Alexander calls it Scarlet Rot Blighted. Now what exactly is that? Well, in the interview part, Miyazaki talked a bit about poison and status ailments in the game. He specifically stated that, When making Elden Ring, I rediscovered my love for making poison swamps. I know how people feel about them, but you know, suddenly I realize I'm in the middle of making one and I just can't help myself. It just happens. And he goes on to say that not only is there poison swamps and toxicity effects in Elden Ring, but there's also something especially horrible that exists, and it's called Scarlet Rot. Now, since we know the Kaelid Wilds are on the desert part of the map, and also that they're blighted by Scarlet Rot, it makes me wonder if that was caused by what happened at the end of the fight between General Radon and Millennia on the battlefield. Whatever we see bloom at the end of the cinematic could be what caused this. But yeah, it's Alexander who wants you to go there, and Dan said that he saw a bit of it before he was stopped by Bandai, but his description seemed eerily familiar to a sky that burns. 
Anyway, another NPC that we meet in Limgrave is a man named Kenneth Height. He's an arrogant NPC who claims to be the ruler of Limgrave. However, his fort has been overrun by beasts and enemies. In his playthrough, Dan went to Fort Height and found it to be a mini dungeon with big enemies and troops, but with no boss. In the fort, there was a special crescent item that he looted, which we'll talk about later. Anyway, after Dan clears out the fort, he goes back to Kenneth, who is pleased and says that he'll throw a feast in our honor. However, the rest of the questline wasn't available in the build Dan was playing. Next up, you meet Irina, and no, not that Irina, but it looks like Miyazaki really likes that name. Anyway, you meet this NPC past the Bridge of Sacrifice, south of Limgrave as you're on your way to the Weeping Peninsula area. She tells you that she escaped from Castle Morn, where supposedly bad things have happened. This is the castle that one of the new gameplay videos from yesterday showed us. On your way there, we can see a minor ur tree. Apparently these minor ur trees give you a golden seed, which increases the amount of healing flasks you own. And as the game goes on, you'll need multiple of these just to increase your flask for one more slot. So for example, to go from 4 to 5 flasks, you may need one, but to go from 5 to 6, you may need like 4 of these seeds or something like that. So, be on the lookout for these minor ur trees as you're playing. Anyway, Castle Morn is a medium-sized dungeon, and I'm sure those of you with a keen eye have already noticed that we actually saw the inside of this castle in an old screenshot. As you can clearly tell by the background, it's the same area. The castle has some tough enemies, as Dan said he had some trouble clearing the mobs there. At the end of the castle, you will fight this boss known as the Lionine Halfbreed. He has two phases, and after you defeat him, you get his weapon, known as the Grafted Blade Greatsword. This greatsword apparently has some big stat requirements, and as such, Dan was not able to wield it to give an impression. The weapon also comes with the Oath of Vengeance Ash of War that raises all your stats and poise. But yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of Castle Morn. This area is entirely optional and very missable, but I'll be sure to look for it myself when I'm playing. Moving on, we finally get to the parts about Stormvale Castle. The beginning area is basically the same as the network test, except apparently when you kill Margit, he drops a talisman pouch, which increases your talisman slot from 2 slots to 3. He also said there's a ton more talismans than the ones we just found in the network test. Dan also says that Stormvale Castle is huge and very easy to get lost in. The path to Godric is simple, but it takes a long time to explore everything in the castle. Jumping is particularly useful as it helps you find some unknown paths by jumping on ledges and such. In his playthrough, Dan reached the end of some bridge in Stormvale, and after several ledge drop-offs, he finds something bizarre, a tiny glowing portal. This sends him to another location across Limgrave that was previously inaccessible. This location is called the Divine Tower of Limgrave. The doors of it, however, are blocked shut unless you have the item. Remember that item I mentioned Dan picked up at Fort Height? Yup, that's right, the Half Moon Crescent. Apparently, this door requires a Full Moon Crescent to open, and since Dan only had a Half Moon Crescent, he couldn't open it, and he didn't find any more during the rest of his time, so whatever lies behind this door is still a mystery. Anyway, he headed back to Stormvale and found Roger, the sorcerer NPC from the gameplay demo. He sells a handful of spells if you're looking to buy any. Later on, he also found some pod enemies in Stormvale Castle. Yes, there are also a hostile version of the pot boys in the game. Not all of them can be like Alexander. These wounds were particularly tough too, as they did whirlwind style attacks and did a lot of damage. Finally, after all of this, he got to the Godric boss fight, who luckily for us has a checkpoint right outside his boss room. And I say luckily because Godric is apparently the toughest first main boss in a From game ever, at least that's how Dan describes it. I would take that with a grain of salt though, as he was only level 20 when he was fighting Godric, and a Bandai representative told Dan that FromSoft expects players to fight Godric at around level 40. So essentially, he was severely underleveled for this fight, and it could contribute to his struggles. Additionally, he said spirit summons were useless against Godric, but again, Dan's spirit summons were not leveled up at this point. 
Regardless though, Godric still has a ton of movesets. Dan says that even on his 15th attempt, he was still discovering new movesets he hadn't seen before. Godric as a fight has two phases, with phase 2 kicking in at 50% HP, and a cinematic playing in which Godric grafts a dragon head to his arm, adding even more moves to his arsenal, including a grab attack, flames from above, and flamethrower assault. After you kill him, he stays dead, and he drops a great rune and also a Remembrance of Godric item, which apparently is the equivalent to a boss soul that you can consume for a lot of runes, and hopefully you will be able to trade it for boss weapons or something. Also another cool thing that happens after you kill Godric is that Gustok, the gatekeeper you meet in front of the castle, shows up and stomps on Godric's corpse, talking crap about him and expressing how glad he is that Godric is dead. I just can't wait to see that for myself. But yeah, that concludes the Stormvale section. And now, let's talk about the next biome past Stormvale. This area, called Dora of the Lakes, contains the Rhea Lucaria Magical Academy. This area starts off with shallow water, fog, and new enemy types. This is also the area where he encountered an ethereal candelabra, a small white structure that stands out and summons ghostly apparition that is meant to guide you to points of interest in the open world. This particular one guided him to a cave with crystals, and what he described to be the largest cave he's seen thus far. After he left the cave, he noticed a shadowy figure in the distance, and as he approached it, it turned out to be a gigantic lobster. No, not one of those crabs we saw in a Gill Lake, but an actual gigantic lobster that is apparently so fast it can catch up with you even if you're mounted. This eventually chased him into the deeper part of the lake, where he had to travel on top of half-submerged buildings. Eventually, he found his way to the Rhea Lucaria entrance. However, it was locked, as you need a glintstone key to enter this area, an item he did not have. But he said he caught a quick glimpse of the surroundings, and he noticed some very intimidating enemies, including war machines shaped as goblin-headed creatures, fully submerged level with balloons in the air, and tons of mages around the castle. He remarked this area as one that was more technology inclined than anything he'd seen before up to this point, something that is to be expected of a magical school academy. This concludes the second biome's description. Now here comes the best area that was described in all the coverage we've gotten so far, and yeah, I saved the best for last. So Dan was just going about his business in East Limgrave, near the area where the bears are. Apparently he aggroed one too many bears and they started chasing him. He eventually found cover inside a mausoleum. However, this mausoleum only had one thing, an elevator. He decided to take the elevator down thinking it was going to lead to some sort of small dungeon. But this elevator just kept going and going and going until it felt like he was halfway to the center of the earth. Eventually, he got to the end and got out, and he looked up to see a purple-tinged meteoric underworld sky. It was a huge subterranean stretch, with potentially multiple entry points from above, and a view that looked like Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis! At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, localized entirely within your kitchen. Down here, rivers flow through ruins, crawling with aggressive spirits, and as he continued to push through, the area name eventually popped up. The Eternal City. Before he goes on further, a Bandai Namco representative instructs him that he's seen enough and he should go back up to the overworld. And reading this made me really excited about this area, I kinda wanna go there right off the bat. The Eternal City was described in the meteorite item description, but I could not imagine it looking anything like what's being described here. But yeah, we're pretty much done in regards to all the new areas that were described. Now, there weren't as many Miyazaki quotes in the cover story as I had anticipated, but he still had some nice insight to give. For one, he said that when Martin wrote the demigods, they were closer to the original form of being a human back before the shattering. However, Frum looked at his story and thought, Hmm, how can we make these characters such inhuman monsters that went mad due to the shards of the Elden Ring being shattered? So essentially, From Software took these human characters Martin created and proceeded to misshape and distort them into something they were not. Miyazaki says that if he gets a chance to show this to Martin when the game comes out, Martin may end up being shocked, as when he wrote them, he was envisioning traditional human drama and fantasy characters. 
<clears throat> Brandon Sanderson in shambles. <clears throat> Moving on, Miyazaki confirmed something that will make a lot of From Software fans very happy, and that is the return of some familiar things. For one, the Moonlight Greatsword, a staple of the company since King's Field, will make a return in Elden Ring. He also confirmed that the Storm Ruler will be a weapon of choice in the game as well, and I hope that means we'll get a gimmick boss that we can use it on. And finally, patches. Patches will also make a return in Elden Ring, and I actually have a funny story with this one. Back when I was having guest hosts that one month last year, I wanted Patches to start us off by being the host on April Fool's Day, cause you know, Patches is a trickster. However, his voice acting company got back to me saying Will Vanderpuy, the voice actor of Patches, can't fulfill my request due to legal reasons. And that made me assume he'll be in Elden Ring, as he probably can't talk about it or mention it due to NDA reasons. It would've been cool to have him on April Fool's Day, but I think the Eileen episode ended up being cooler in the end. I genuinely can't believe that was like 10 months ago, we've come such a long way since. I mean, whoever envisioned that an Elden Ring update would be this long, I sure as heck didn't. But anyway, thanks for sticking around till the end. I wanted to have this video out earlier, but there was just so much news that it took forever to compile everything and write the script. Still, I hope you found this video to be informative and increase the hype, as we're now less than 4 weeks away from Elden Ring's release. So for now, this has been your daily Elden Ring update for January 29th. 2022.